Welcome to Black Onyx, where we hope to keep you better informed. We're discussing the regulatory topic phase, Financial Advisory and Intermediary Services Act. With me is Mark Preston, the Chief Operating Officer from Lorium Capital. Mark, thank you very much for joining us and sharing in your knowledge about the Act. Thanks very much, Andrew. What is the purpose of the FASE Act? So, Andrew, the, the FASE Act is there to um, effectively protect consumers of uh, financial products uh, in the financial services sector. Effectively, what it's trying to do is uh, regulate the activities of financial services providers as well as those that are tasked with selling those products to the end consumers be it people providing advice or be it people providing intermediary services around those products. So really the, the purpose of the FASE Act is, is to provide two things. One, uh, to establish and regulate a financial services industry um, and, and to pro professionalise the financial services industry in the process. And number two, to protect the end consumer about what they're buying. It does this by regulating financial services providers, uh, as well as allowing an environment to provide adequate information to end consumers by the product providers themselves, as well as those selling the products, again, those giving advice and intermediary services, um, uh, to, to afford that end consumer uh, the ability to make an informed decision. Who administers the FASE Act and how do they do so? At the top level, it's the FSCA, or, or previously uh, the FSB Financial Services Board. Uh, they're effectively there, established by statute, to govern the SA non-banking financial services industry in this country. Um, they, in turn, have a department called the FASE Department, uh, headed by the FASE Registrar, who is tasked with um, overseeing and regulating the financial advisory and intermediary services space. And they do this through three distinct departments. The first department being the registration department, uh, more of an administrative department, providing licenses, um, updating profiles, collecting levies, these sorts of things. Number two, the supervision department. These are the guys that come on site, do risk assessment visits, um, es essentially making sure that you are complying with what you need to comply with as far as the FASE Act is concerned. Then of course you've got the enforcement department. Uh, these are the guys that are wrapping you over the knuckles for things you probably shouldn't be doing or unregistered businesses or the like. They're obviously also the department that is in touch with the Ombud. Um, the Ombud uh, you know, clearly serving uh, end consumers' interests insofar as complaints are concerned and these sorts of things, so they're in direct communication with them about any complaints and the investigation of those complaints. What is required to become an authorised financial services provider under the FASE Act? So all FSPs require a licence to operate as a financial services provider in this country and it's the FSCA that grants those license, licences to um, you know, eligible financial services providers. I think what's probably most important about this is they will only grant those licenses to financial services providers who meet the fit and proper requirements. Uh, this is kind of a central theme that runs through the FASE Act and uh, is obviously a prerequisite for becoming a financial services provider. So I believe it's section 8 in, um, in the FASE Act that deals with the process in terms of applying for a a financial services provider license, but effectively all it means is uh, submitting an application to the FASE Registrar um, where you, you know, meeting certain um, requirements and the FASE Registrar duly considering that application and either uh, granting you a license uh, with or without conditions or rejecting the, the license application where they will obviously uh, give you reason for the rejection uh, where after you may choose to reapply. In your opinion, what are the most important features of the Act that a key individual, representative or an individual under supervision must comply with? So the FASE Act is, is quite clear when it says that once you've been issued with a licence, you have to continuously prove the fact that you meet the fit and proper requirements. That not only applies to the provider itself, but those acting on behalf of the, the provider. So it's the key individuals and the representatives or anyone else selling that financial product uh, to the end consumer. So 
And, you know, my first point here is that the fit and proper requirements are probably the most important thing, if not one of the two most important things uh, running through the Phase Act. What are the fit and proper requirements? Well, the fit and proper requirements are uh, the ability, uh, you know, showing honesty and integrity at all times, uh, showing competence through, you know, requisite qualifications or, you know, through writing the, the exams that the, the Phase Act uh, prescribes. Um, it's proving your experience at all times or making sure that you have enough experience to be able to do what, what you need to be, do, be doing. Uh, proving that your business or your sole prop or, or whatever form it's in uh, has the operational ability to carry out its functions. So that includes uh, oversight over your representatives you know, by the key individuals. Uh, it also includes uh, making sure that you, um, you've got adequate financial records and internal controls and you know, client retention records and all these sorts of, and, and obviously the ability to handle client cash, these sorts of things. And then the last thing under the fit and proper requirements is financial soundness, just to make sure that you operate as a going concern with you know, the ad adequate capital adequacy, these sorts of things. And then the second thing I think that's, m that's very important to the FASE Act is uh, your codes of conduct, which uh, the FASE Act prescribes. Okay? Uh, some similar themes running through the code of conduct, but essentially all it's there to do is to tell us what we, how, how we should or shouldn't be behaving. It sets the minimum standards for us as an industry uh, uh, to determine our behavior to the end client. Okay, so again, things like operational ability um, you know, come in here. So it's the ability for FSPs to uh, protect client interests at all times and, and serve those clients. It governs how we can market and advertise to those clients. These sorts of things um, coming through in the codes of conduct. What systems does Lorium Capital have in order to comply with the FASE Act? We ensure compliance with the FASE Act mainly through the appropriate setup of our compliance function. Like many others out there, uh, we, um, uh, the, the, the FASE Act determines that you can set up a, a compliance function with others performing that task. Um, we're obviously all too aware that the mere setup of that function doesn't necessarily absolve us of our responsibility to, uh, to take control over, over that compliance function. But what we are allowed to do is we're allowed to appoint a, a compliance officer who needs to be approved by the FSCA, or again, previously the FSB, um, and who can carry out certain functions on our behalf. Okay, that can be an external or an in internal compliance officer, both of which need to be approved. So it's the compliance officer that is essentially there to monitor our compliance with the FASE Act at all times. It's our responsibility as key individuals of a financial services provider to set up that compliance function, uh, to determine what controls there should be within that compliance function, and to effectively manage it as opposed to oversee it, which is the job of the compliance officer. So, Lorium Capital has uh, a bunch of things that we do on a regular basis um, to ensure that we comply with the FASE Act. Um, these are not necessarily prescribed, or some of them are prescribed by the FASE Act, but not all of them are prescribed by the FASE Act. Uh, these things include uh, monthly meetings with our compliance officer, which is one of the items that is prescribed by the FASE Act. It includes um, employees, all employees signing up contractually uh, to certain requirements uh, in the FASE Act, that's actually in their employment contract. They're also required to sign up to a compliance file, which includes literally all of our policies, uh, you know, PA trading, su succession plans and the like. We do frequent employee training, uh, you know, uh, throughout the year, uh, some of which are prescribed by the FASE Act, but some of which are in addition to the FASE Act, where we feel like, um, you know, we need more or we lack knowledge in a, in a certain environment. Importantly, ensuring that all of our KIs and reps acting on our behalf uh, meet the fee, uh, fit and proper requirements at all times. Again, central to the FASE Act. Does your organisation have an internal or external compliance officer? So we make the use of an external compliance officer. Um, we do this because um, I think like most boutique managers out there, we like to stay lean and mean. Uh, so we like to uh, focus on essentially what we believe we're good at. Um, again, that's not to say that we 
completely absolving ourselves of our responsibility for a compliance function. In fact, we take this very, very seriously indeed, and we certainly make sure we know what to do at all times and, and know what we need to comply with. Um, but in terms of the day-to-day -day functions and the reporting to the registrar and the FSCA, uh, we do like to use a, an external compliance officer for this. Uh, additionally, we like to, we, or we believe in what the FASE Act tells you to do, and that is maintain independence between yourself and your compliance officer. We really think this is an important um, uh, thing to maintain, and the easiest way to maintain it is by appointing an external compliance officer. How does your compliance officer assist Lorium Capital with complying with the FASE Act? I mentioned before that one of the main functions the compliance officer is there to do is to monitor our compliance with the FASE Act. Um, he does this essentially three ways. So the first way is that he identifies and improves any perceived weaknesses in our business. The second way is ensuring that our controls are effective and, and implemented, internal controls in this case. And the third way is constantly testing or reviewing or the integrity of the controls within our business. So the other functions they perform for us and um, you know, is essentially value add on their side is obviously dealing with the registrar or liaising with the registrar from time to time, uh, taking responsibility for all, uh, reporting to the registrar. Um, they provide recommendations from time to time. They help, help us with our sample testing. They come in here and do spot sample testing uh, you know, pretty much every quarter. They also supervise and oversee our compliance function. In your words, Mark, how does the FASE Act impact the financial services sector? So I believe that the FASE Act has essentially done what it set out to do, and that is to professionalise the finan financial services industry, but also to protect client in interests. Um, it's done this by essentially providing us with um, you know, a piece of market conduct regulation. In other words, the do's and don'ts, or at the very least, the minimum standards uh, about what we as a financial services industry need to do or how we need to behave to serve the interests of our end consumers. The legislation has been rigor rigorously applied with the three departments I mentioned earlier, in my opinion at least, effectively fulfilling their mandates. This has meant, for example, that you know, on, uh, in the first instance, applying for a license, uh, and in the second instance, actually maintaining that license is not merely a formality. It's actually quite difficult to do, and the, you know, the uh, the barriers to entry are quite high, and the minimum standards for for getting that license are quite high. It has also meant that FSPs and those acting on behalf of those S FSPs have been handed down a duty to serve the best interests of clients at all times. Uh, to prom and obviously to promote a trustworthy financial services industry, which I think it's done. The result has been to instill trust and confidence in consumers of financial products and those selling those financial products or providing advice and intermediary services. Not to mention the fact that these consumers have an efficient and affordable dispute resolution mechanism uh, in the form of a phase ombud. Mark, in your opinion, does the FASE Act aid or hinder business for financial service providers? In my opinion, definitely aid. An industry that is there to serve the best interests of their clients at all times, or at the very least an act that requires you to do so, is ultimately a going to be a successful industry. While the barriers to entry are clear to see, um, ultimately, it's, in my opinion, it's very necessary uh, to, for the protection of consumers. What are the penalties or fines applicable for non-compliance to the FASE Act? Penalties for not complying with the FASE Act include monetary fines of up to a million rand and or imprisonment of up to 10 years, as scary as that sounds, but also things like withdrawal of FSP licenses and the debarment of representatives and key individuals of that FSP. Mark, thank you for joining us, sharing your time and your knowledge about the Phased Act. Thank you very much for having me, Andrew. Really appreciate it. And thank you for tuning into Black Onyx. For more details, please visit our website.